I had a brief scare that we might be wrong, but Sydney always believed that genetics would trump biochemistry and it usually did. So, you know, that's those of us who do genetics find uh, this always sort of a chuck, brings a chuckle. Uh, just to straighten the whole historical thing, I should point out that in uh, 2002, there was a, a letter in science from Alan Garrens, uh, uh, from Alan Garren, uh, putting things into perspective. He says that Sydney was, uh, you know, tended to forget the contributions of other people. And uh, uh, sort of, he says that uh, those who want to delve further into the chapter of early molecular genetics, my review, might serve as a counterbalance to Sydney's remembrances of things long past. Uh, interestingly, uh, this list of references also has a reference to Garen and Siddiqui. This is a second reference to Siddiqui today. Uh, somebody in the morning mentioned Siddiqui uh, sort of projecting, uh, Obed Siddiqui projecting, uh, predicting 30 years hence and so on. Well, here was an early paper which showed that certain triplets would have to be nonsense triplets in the genome. So that was a Gavin and Siddiqui paper. So it was exciting times. So when this got over, the golden age of molecular genetics they thought was coming to an end and most of the pioneers uh, started to turn their attention to other big problems in biology, uh, neurobiology and developmental biology were high on people's lists. Simo Benzer turned to Drosophila, but Sydney rejected it because he thought that his nervous system was too complicated. Streisinger went from fish to zebrafish. Cyrus Leventhal went from bacteria to rotifers. Francois Jacob from bacteria to neuroblastoma. And then there was Sydney. All this is from genes reminiscences. He looked for an organism with a very simple nervous system. The idea was then to then map the whole firing diagram then find mutants which affect the behavior of the organism, then look for changes in the wiring diagram, and with a few mutants and a few changes in the diagram, he hoped to explain how the nervous system brings about behavior. So, Sydney searched the literature and came up with the tiny free-living nematode named Cenorhabditis elegans, and the rest is history. I often tell people why C. elegans was chosen because it's a self-fertilizing hermaphrodite, which makes it possible to uh, automatically get homozygosity for recessive mutations, right? Because you can have a recessive mutation in a heterozygous worm that you can make sperm and eggs with the same recessive mutation, fertilization of one with the other would make it homozygous and uh, you can see the mutants uh, by their behavior. So uh, that was really the motivation there. Now this is my last uh, slide, again from Katz's reminiscences. Katz says, every so often I would come up with a crazy idea for an experiment. Sydney would say, do it or else somebody at the Oklahoma Poultry Institute will do it and it will work. I doubt that there was an Oklahoma Poultry Institute, but I got the idea, right? <laughs> Actually, I Googled it, even now there is no Oklahoma Poultry Institute. <laughs> but when I Googled, I did find that there is a Directorate of Poultry Research in Hyderabad, right? And uh, it would have been nice to have some people from there at today's meeting. Uh, but uh, uh, when I actually set up my lab, yeah, it occurred to me that my lab in CDFD would really rate as an OPI, right, in Sydney's terms, because they were politically incorrect times, right. They meant that Oklahoma is in flyover country in America. They meant that, you know, whatever is worthwhile research goes on in Boston or New York and in Stanford and the Bay Area or LA or something, and people fly over things like Oklahoma, right? So basically, I don't think you had to be in Oklahoma or doing poultry. I think Nampali also is in Oklahoma, right? So it occurred to me that uh, if you are there, then you better adopt OPI worthy craziness, right, in your own world. And I'm going to sort of, now I can't resist the temptation to say something about me. So I'll tell you about our crazy uh, experiment, which I like to think Sydney would approve of. In our lab, we had, uh, you know, found the various translocations in Neurospora grassa, mapped the breakpoints to uh, the genome sequence. And so we were now in a position 
we had we knew everything molecularly and genetically about the translocation that we needed to know so we could actually introgress it from neurospora crassa into neurospora tetrasperma right and tetrasperma is actually like a fungal sea elements it, it you know has in crassa each uh, ascospore of the each of the eight Ascospores and an ascus is initially uninucleate. It can be big A or little a. So a cross has to happen between mycelia from two different ascospores. In tetrasperma, each ascospore in a four spore ascus is binucleate. It has one big A and one little a. So each mycelium can be self crossed, like C. elements. And uh, uh, if you have a translocation in one nucleus and a normal sequence in the other nucleus, you can actually get two kinds of heterocarions. It can either be T plus N or DP plus DX. I've written that here. You can get two kinds of heterocarions and by self-crossing them, you can keep going back and forth. You can go from T plus N to DP plus DF. Or you self-cross DP plus DF, you can go to T plus N. You can't ever otherwise make a DP plus DF right, heterocarion. You can make T plus N heterocarions, but you can't make DP plus DF except this way. Right? And we made the first ones. So I like to think that you know this would uh, sort of Sydney would approve. In fact, I know that Marty Jalti approved when he visited. We talked about this to him. And Marty Jalti was Sydney's postdoc and you know so it's Sydney's approval as much as his, right? So that was very useful. I think I, that was the last slide. I'll stop with the slides. I'll sum up. Uh, I've run out of time. So what have I told you? And what was the point of telling you all this? Uh, I tried to tell you how you know, elegantly in just a few brush strokes, as it were, they did. It's a two-page paper. Right? They were able to show that an unknown mutation is a UGA. For that, they used aminopurine and hydroxylamine to go back and forth. And they used amber and ochre suppressors. And um, they uh, used the power of fate genetics, yeah, which is unparalleled for, uh, for uh, uh, studying crossing over. So actually, they used the best system available. The thing that uh, Gene uh, mentioned in another email while I was exchanging it with him is that they still don't know and they don't care what the R gene product codes for. Right? They may know. I, I mean, I don't know uh, what the latest is on the R, R locus uh, research in phage, but uh, they were using this as a model system. This was the old days of model systems where you use something for the uh, powerful tools that it provided you without necessarily uh, deviating from the original problem of the genetic code. So that was that. Then how they, uh, how at least in Sidney Brenner's case, he did a careful survey of what to do after phage and he got into C. elegans. And uh, the interesting thing was actually this when this was being done, Gene was a graduate student, he recalls to me that uh, one night Sydney came down to the lab, he was the only one, Gene was the only one there and told, gave the first results of a three-point cross in C. elegans, right? So some dumpy and unk mutants were, he was showing the numbers and that was truly exciting, right, at the, at the time. Huh? And it's true that uh, um, many things, I think, uh, some of the mutants that they got were affected in uh, programmed cell death and so on. That's where, uh, you know, the whole field of apoptosis and so on blossomed from C. elegans research. 